Thanks so much for inviting me. And uh, I just want to comment on the reproducibility issue. I mean, there's a, there's a commentary out in Nature today or a couple of last, last couple of days. This is a big deal. And I think uh, anybody wanting to invest in career activities, it's a very important thing to be looking at. Um, we are very troubled by it ourselves in trying to reproduce experiments. I'd really like to thank you for your invitation to talk today. And it's an exciting meeting for me to meet such diverse people and to be excited by the, the concepts and ideas already in the coffee. I, I've been, uh, my mind's blown. So um, these are intractable problems. I, I had a cool talk by uh, uh, Schmidt, who, who my, what's his first name? The guy runs Alphabet, whatever. So um, Eric, so he was at MIT recruiting and, and he was talking about tractable and intractable problems. And to Google, uh, they're looking for intractable problems they can solve. Um, they say Alexa is a solved problem. I don't know what you think. But the take home on that is that they're looking for a problem that will affect at least a billion people, impact at least a billion people, and can be solved within 10 years. And actual, actually, I think Alzheimer's fits really nicely into that. And uh, you know, seeing the history of the way things have been happening in terms of Alzheimer's as a drug target success, um, I imagine you have some concerns, as, as, we do, as do we. So my talk map I'd just like to show you today is um, about uh, thinking about target prioritization and challenges. And it was a great intro by Philippe. So it's nice to see you again, Philippe, again. This is really cool to hear what's happening at Open Targets. I want to talk a little bit about genes versus pathways, a little tension there. Uh, I want to describe this new technology we have called functional fingerprinting and functional FIMS, as we call them, interaction maps. Uh, how we're applying genetic insights into that, how this collides with machine learning. It's coming through the talk as I talk. And then pathway drug mapping for repurposing, which a lot of people do. I just want to give you our flavor on that. So um, working in a gene uh, sequencing type consortium where we're together with Rudy Tanzi at MassGen Mass in the States, um, we have a familial study. We're working with about 600 people's uh, DNA. We've sequenced it. We're actually writing it up right now. It's really exciting. but. I'm often asked this question, can you make a definitive statement, Winston? Can you give me some systematic support? Sort of the things which open targets do, but how does this, this particular locus that we find an interesting variant in relate? How can we make a story where you know, me as the PI or the PI saying to me, you know, I'm not going to look like a fool if I go for it? And that's actually quite interesting that a geneticist will say that, because you know, genetic information is powerful, but people are quite nervous about pushing a particular variant or gene for good reason. And if you look at the recent failure of the Merck trial for the base one inhibitor, uh, a lot of money's gone into well-reasoned approaches. And I think the efforts of open targets and others are really trying to uh, reduce the risk on these, but it's not happening yet. And what's intri intriguing about these choices is, are that they're knowledge-driven. This is a great potential target. It's an enzyme that really affects the pathology of Alzheimer's. And so you know, its failure is, is disheartening. And it comes back to this issue of the internal dynamics within the community. I know something you don't know, and I think it's important, so I think you should know it, for I'm standing here today. However, data and data-driven says the following aspects of the data you have give us this structure. Do you, are you aware of that? And there's that tension, because the data-driving people are not necessarily the best communicators, and the, the, uh, the knowledge-driving people may not be the best listeners. And so there's a lot of tension, as you can imagine. And you see that inside pharmaceutical companies in terms of drug choice and target choice. And you see that uh, as a tension that must, we have to try and overcome. So one aspect of applying machine learning is that uh, it can potentially help because it can accumulate large sets of data. But the issue around that large data is that it's not really designed for the kind of data that we've had. In, in general, it's been worked on very, very large scale. You know, there's a billion, the billion data point Facebook problem. So in neuroscience and omics data sets, we have a lot of internal structure. And that's nice, but it's not big data in the same concept. It's highly structured, however, and the structure of that and determining the features of that structure really is where the meat lies, I think, in a, a pr appropriate application of the collision between machine learning and the kind of science that we're doing in computational biology. So uh, I was also fortunate to hear a talk. I've been hanging out a lot at MIT recently by Varga, Barbara Engelhardt, who's up from Princeton, actually a few, uh, earlier this week. Was it, is it, what week is it? <laughs> um, and, but she, she mentioned four, four terms. She said machine learners really care about, which is tractability, is this a tractable problem? Interrupt, interpretability, can we assess the value of what we're seeing? And you know, that's really a big deal, because that's kind of it's very con concordant with how we have problems in computational biology. Big, big issue, reproducibility and validatability. 
And so um, we need to think then about those approaches as we go through the rest of this talk. So um, I want to talk about click sourcing. And click sourcing is uh, interesting because it's, it can be an email that somebody sends and says, you know, I think you really should take a look at this particular gene. I'm, I'm interested in it. Or it can be a talk by a senior vice president who's picked up a message at a particular pharmaceutical company and says, you know, he thinks or she thinks this is an important drug we should target. We should go and take a further look at it. And there becomes this emotional investment that is connected to a particular piece of knowledge. It's fascinating. And I think there's a good PhD thesis in there for somebody who wants to beat their head against the wall. But the take home is that this compelling knowledge concept is a real big deal. And anyone who works in academia and has moonlighted in pharmaceuticals like myself um, finds it very challenging to communicate that. But the take home is that I've been at, in a room like this where everybody's got a clicker, and it's the annual review of targets. And you know, people will happily click away at the 20 or 30 presentations. And at the end of the day, the quantitative assessment of the targets for the company are based upon the number of clicks within that room. And that's the definition of knowledge bias. But it's very much what, what can drive very expensive decisions. So we kind of have to move away from that. But at the same time, you know, there have to be viable paradigms. Um, here's an example of one. So this is a, a, a piece of work by Alipa et al. Um, and I, I picked it up because I liked the, the approaches. They, they were talking about, you know, they're comparing the use of, uh, they were looking at uh, the, the, the granddaughter of, of uh, CMAP, which is Lynx, and this, this re drug repurposing system where you're looking at perturbations of gene expression across a lot of tissues and a lot of uh, cell lines in a systematic way. And then they're linking that to mesh terms. So you're getting, bringing in the biomedical corpus. And then they're using deep neural nets. So these are all great buzzwords. But they were looking at either using genes or pathways as their um, activation uh, measures and basically looking to see if they could use that information, feed it into the DNA, and see what they got out. Now, actually, they got pretty good results. Also, numbers around 0 0.7, 0 0.69. It seems to be a popular number also in cancers where the, the best, best results came. And there were lots of other very much more poorly performing uh, results that came out of that. And really, two things came out of that study. One, when you look at gene sets or pathways, they perform better as classifiers in terms of looking at the summary activity of a set of genes. And the other was that the accuracy is really heterogeneous. It depends on, effectively, what data you're putting into the system and how well it's mapped to the terms. That's no news, but it really brings into stark relief this issue of reproducibility and also scalability. Okay? So um, my group's for a long time been looking at this aspect of systematic representation of function. I originally was trained as a, system a systematic biologist, and so that's something I've always cared about. And so I've tried to use my version of systems biology means can be related to other stuff. And in order to do that, we have to have a way of standardizing representation of function. And that's actually really difficult to do, as you can imagine. So one of the ways we've done that is something we call functional fingerprinting. And what we take into that are pathways. And those pathways can be defined by knowledge, or they can be defined by us or others, where we looked at a data-driven de de description of a pathway, a fundamental set of co-expressed sets of genes that, that look like they behave in a functionally uh, related grouping. And we call this methodology pathway fingerprinting. We published it in 2013 in Genome Medicine. And We've just released, re -re we're going through a re-release now, so I think the re-release is going to be hopefully more valuable because we're really expanding its use and it's, it's available in Bioconductor. And what we're effectively doing <coughs> is, we, is putting together, we have developed and basically sent out a method here where we take any gene expression experiment and we look at the summary activity of a certain pathway in that experiment by looking at its activities. We pass that, that pathway across the whole of the gene expression omnibus. And we, what we do as a result of that is we get a distribution of activities for that particular pathway. And then we can say, using a statistical cutoff, whether it's, you know, so we can convert it to some binary measure and say it's on or off. So we have an activation, an, an activation for that pathway according to distribution. So then when you look at that pathway in your own experiment, you can say that pathway is on or off. You can take any number of pathways or gene sets to put them together, and you can build a vector out of that. Once you have a vector, that's very computable. And that means that we can compute comparisons between all kinds of things. And one of the things that the Harvard Stem Cell Institute we had to do a lot of was comparing cells. And this is very valuable as well for looking at single cell data. And effectively, what we would do is ask the question, can we, do, can we recapitulate a cellular ont ontogeny? And we use phylogenetic approaches to do that. And here you can see a recapitulation of a hematopoietic hematopoietic stem cell as it's, as it's developing to various stem cell types, into various types. And you can see there's only, the only discordance you see, is our, you see in this are in the T cells, which are specific to, to species. But we can see a cro no cross-species effect occurring, and that's really, really good. So we're able to get away from a lot of the batch, which you normally see in microarray and RNA-seq experiments. So 
that really brought to mind the concept, and that was what happens if we have a pair of uh, pathways which appear consistently to be co-activated, and we can measure that now using similar technology to this. And that brought to mind the idea of functional interaction maps, and my student at uh, the, Dep the Biostats Department at Harvard School of Public Health um, has recently just graduated, and we've submitted his paper to PLOS on this particular aspect. We're quite excited about it because it's scalable. And the idea is that we could look at canonical co activation. We could also look at discorrelation or disco activation between pathways where we see a change in the topology of a particular network of pathway interactions. So, um, you know, thinking is free, applying is difficult, getting funding is even worse, um, making a product that people use, let's go down that line, you know, it's getting smaller and smaller. But I like to do the thinking stuff because that's cheap, right? But mapping this information in some way and making it learnable is really a big uh, impetus that we have because if you've got a standardized data set, the first thing you want to be able to do is to find out what's in it. And secondly, of course, you want to be able to learn upon it. So it's very much a resource that I think the AI community could use well. So one of the things which uh, I think is very important is the context and, the, in other words, the um, interpretability of the results you get. So a question you often get is, how does my gene set relate to other curated data, and can I position my signature on a high-level map of cellular function? It's very difficult to do, um, actually, if, uh, if you just go out there and try and use tools. So that's been driving what we've, why we've developed this technology. Um, so if we have this, then we can also try and start to look at the genomic upstreams, and I'll get to that in a little while. So one of the approaches that is existing to take a look at this is through gene set enrichment. And this is work in Gary Bader's group, and effectively what they've built is a system to mine existing gene set enrichments and then to connect them together where there's a gene overlap. And by doing that, you can build relationships between pathways, which is kind of neat, and you can provide uh, statistical assumptions. And this is a very powerful tool, uh, but it ends where the gene overlap ends. Okay? So what we've taken a look at is this. This is the only real um, uh, algorithmics I'll show you, but effectively what we've taken a look at is to build a co-activation matrix of pathways. And if you just think about it, we're working at the top with uh, taking uh, a set of subset of geo, and then we're asking, as we go through this, if we can take experiment-level estimates of activity of particular gene sets, and we do a partial correlation between gene sets. And once we've done that pathway correlation, we can then uh, compensate for within, within experiment uh, variation, and effectively we end up with a pathway co-expression network or pathway co-activation network. And that's a static network, but we can add stuff to it and recompute. Okay? So here's an example of a result from that. If we, if we query, query and we put into that network the gene ontology, and we come back, we query with axonogenesis, these are the, uh, the gene sets we get out. You can see ones in red, which are, um, de which are, which are um, negatively related to axonogenesis, and the ones in black, which are positively related to axonogenesis. So you know, even at the most trivial level, you're seeing two different types of function appearing. And if you want to dive into it, you can then go into gene sets and start to play around. Okay. And what, what we can do then is test and say, okay, what are the relationships between pathways? So if we ask with respect to a disease, gene, a disease set, and we, we query with, this, with type 2 diabetes, we can look at the, the correlated pathways. And here they appear. We can then ask, is there genetic enrichment from genome-wide association with those pathways? And this is work we've done with Mark McCarthy. And effectively, what that can yield is that, yes, you can have significant enrichment for genetically associated uh, enrichment with respect to pathways which are correlated in terms of their co-activation with your seed. And then we can do the same in terms of reproducibility in a different disease. And this is recent work, uh, as I say, we're under now review. And here is a ADCL, is this little blue node here, and that means Alzheimer's disease curated list. And it's been curated by my colleagues in the Alzheimer's community. Effectively, what we're asking is, with a set of known genes that we think are very important in Alzheimer's, what correlates with that? We look at its actual expression. Now, those known genes are mostly genetically identified, and there's a lot of um, poorly, poor understanding of the relationship between genetically identified loci and differences of expression. We'll explore that in a little bit in a moment with you. But the take home is that you can see there are correlated pathways, and if you take those which are related only by the fact that they're correlated as opposed to gene overlap, because if we, this is correlation on the left without gene overlap, and on the right in blue is, uh, is removing the, the gene overlap in that sense by showing the thickness of the line represents the amount of gene overlap. You can see there are pathways appearing which don't have any direct gene overlap with the query. Now, what's important about that is that these gene sets, actually, once you look into their, their viability, are uh, for um, relationship to the disease. They're all very highly related to the disease, disease in the text corpus. And then if you look for genetic enrichment, uh, the very 
very much enriched with uh, genetic lo genetically defined loci as well. So this is promising. You know, it's promising. Is it a model? No, but it's really good stuff, right? So the idea then is we can start to build systematic functional representation and build a data-derived map. We can definitely build the map, okay? The question is how valuable is it? Well, let's do some AI, right? Let's do some AI. So the thing is to test it, and that means benchmarking, okay? So we'll get to that in a moment. So we'd like to scale that to drug response uh, data, and I'll show you a little bit of an example of that in a while. So uh, another person that's been influential in my thinking is Andreas Califano, and he, he made a statement, we need context-specific networks of molecular interactions, and he said that in 2012. And effectively, this idea of cellular networks is something that I've really been into for a long, long time, being influenced by a lot of people, and the take-home is that to, do, to build those, you have to move out of one modality. You can't just sit in the comfort zone of your known algorithmics. You have to work in outside of gene expression. And that's great because because the opportunities to do that are through collaboration around the world, as you can imagine. And we've worked together with a couple of consortia to build that kind of stuff. How does this work? And to do that, we have to have a platform. So we've convinced Biogen to help us establish the Center for Genome Translation in Sheffield. And effectively, this, I use this to get the money, by the way. It doesn't have any real meaning. But um, <laughs> you, know, you have to stand in front of VPs, right? So, <laughs> so Sally, Sally John and others funded this. But the take home is what we've built is a systems modeling system, which is, integrates these data that I've been talking to you. And we've now applied it in two areas, one with the National Institutes of Health, and that's been with the um, Accelerating Medicines Partnership for Alzheimer's Disease. And that's a pre-competitive consortium looking at a whole bunch, as they say in the States, of postmortem brains and their, their information in terms of UQTLs, uh, uh, overall gene expression, uh, exon scan, uh, whole genome sequencing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And RIC, okay. And then also, um, where should I be pointing this? All right. Also with the Circuits Consortium, which is funded through Cure Alzheimer's Disease. And these two consortia, then, we're bringing that data together. And what we've managed to do is, first of all, here's the AMP-AD. You can see the ideas of the kinds of data sets that we have. We also have this important aspect of having mouse models. But the bottom line is to have the networks that come out of this as our data, okay? And that is topical. And the reason it's topical is because there's a problem. And that is that GWA is not giving us answers yesterday. It's not giving us what we want. It's all this money and where's the data coming from? And that's actually been a very nicely commented on by uh, Pritchard, uh, Jonathan Pritchard and Boyle in the cell paper where they were looking at this concept uh, in, in height, okay, where effectively, what are the genetic, so genetic associations or contribution to height? And basically, um, there's minuscule contributions all over the genome. And running a, a 100,000 base pair window across the genome, you'll find that there's pretty much always one SMP in that, gene, that, that window that contributes in some minuscule proportion to height. And uh, that's not super surprising, but at the same time, um, it makes you think, because if you're looking at the model from that perspective, it's very different than if you're looking at it from give me any genetic association that reaches a certain strict cutoff, okay, in terms of genome-wide association. So um, this brings, brings to the fore that there are a lot of genes interacting with a lot of other genes. No shit, Batman. But the bottom line is that some of them have more genetic contribution than others. That doesn't mean that the ones that are contributing, that con contributing slightly are not informing us as to the, as to the model of the disease. And if, I'm, and if I'm particularly interested in the causal basis of the disease, I'm going to want to have a comprehensive model. Okay? So um, if we take that forward, we can take GWA hits and cluster them and see how they behave. And if we look at that regulatory proximity to GWA, what basically happens is that you can find that there are genes expressed that express when they're linked in networks very closely to GWA hits more so than you'd expect by chance, okay? And this is a diagram from the paper, and you can see the core genes and the stars in the middle, and basically, as you go out in terms of the, 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 the layers of the onion, one, two, or three more steps away, you, you can capture pretty much all of the GWA hits, okay? And you can capture all of the gene expression as well. So the gene expression clusters around the GWA hits, but it does so in a network that has topology. And you can interrogate that topology, and you can interrogate how that topology changes in the disease condition as opposed to the case condition. That's valuable, because that starts to give you a means to drill down to methodology and mechanism. So we've been using similar concepts, and we've looked at target prioritization from the perspective of this correlation. Are genes co-expressed? And what I want to share with you is a methodology we've developed, and we're working with something called the ROSMAP uh, consortium, which basically is highly characterized uh, RNA data coming out of this uh, AMPAD uh, uh, collaboration. And effectively, what we found is that if we correlate the gene expression of any two pairs of genes, and we look at the case condition and the control condition, 
when we look at the case condition and we look for a change in the correlation, and usually we look for a, a, a sign change, okay, we can basically discover that the correlation stays pretty much the same in 99% of the cases. But in the 1% it doesn't, it's quite interesting. Okay? If we do the same for pathway summary set correlations, we can immediately rank the pathways which appear to be the most discorrelated. And here is uh, PSEN1, and the pathways around it are the most discorrelated with respect to PSEN1. Actually, that's the top one. And PSEN1 is a very, a pathway, is, is, as you know, is very heavily involved in Alzheimer's. So it, so it kind of looks good. But once again, how well are we doing? Don't know. Because we don't really have a way of assessing. What we do have is we have stuff that looks good. And you can always go to a biologist, and they'll then say, let me validate. And that's kind of the paradigm we have now. And we want to change that. And that's where we, want, we think it's time to look into making more informed choices by using larger corpuses of knowledge and working with AI. So what is the relationship between variance and this dysregulated network topology? Well, it's some, I had some fun with this. And effectively, let's look at the H index, OK? So if you look at any two pairs of genes in the center, there's a central gene. There's two looking at it. There's two correlated with it. And uh, we go through this negative and positive correlation paradigm, which I've just described to you. You can decide which genes are changing significantly in their correlation. And you can build hubs. And this looks like an H index, right? And so there's a similar concept called a lobby index, and that's what we used. And effectively, if you take a look at that lobby index, this is work that was presented by a group that we developed this methodology and similarity to at Biogen, and they presented it back at MIT. So there's been this, like, who invented it? I don't care. But it's not invented. But it's like we're, they're using the technologies that we, we hoped they'd use. So we're really excited. The take home is that um, this lobby index idea allows you to Think about those genes which are at the core of these hubs that may have the most impact. And if you build those out and then look for those genes which are in apple cores or in the cores of onions that have the most enrichment with genetic association, maybe those genes are quite influential in terms of their contribution to the disease. So we used that, that thought experiment and we applied it. And here's the list of the top most influential genes, the most influential hubs. And right at the top, the ones in dark are uh, known Alzheimer's genes or associated with Alzheimer's, but the top one's actually a non-coding gene. And it codes through to a locus that is very important in Alzheimer's. But when we take a look at it, and we use data coming in from the, the Phantom Consortium, which I've been very uh, active with, that allows us to uh, look at my spelling, microglial activation, got it wrong, sorry. But the, the take home is that it allows us to assess the potential value of this target from a biological perspective by utilizing information from existing public corpus. And that's effectively what we do and how we go into open targets. This, this gene was actually in open targets, I think, uh, Philippe, uh, and I actually used some information on it when I was presenting it recently. And actually, I think it gave me the link to the read-through to this gene APP, which is very well characterized in um, uh, Alzheimer's, as you know. And it's reading through into, the, into a gene which regulates the processing of that. So you, know, you can make biological inferences. But once again, we want to have some systematic score or some systematic evaluation because we've got large data. So we're working on that. But we have, we're putting the pieces together right now. And coming from the uh, Alzheimer's study that I've been working on, we've found 316 variants that are resilient and uh, a number that uh, associate with risk. And these are found in familial cohorts, and that means that we can have, um, we can move away effectively from the GWA paradigm, and that allows us to replicate some of those. And what we found is if we pump those into the networks and, and look at that problem from the perspective of this uh, Boileval paper in term, and Pritchard in terms of the you know, number of steps away from our target gene, we can see that some genes are one hop or some genes are two hops away uh, if from, that are identified by variants with respect to our functionally important variants. I sort of turned things on its head. I haven't put the GY in the middle. I've put the functional important thing. And I said, how does it become decorated with genetic information? Uh, if you look at the statistics on that, the random is at the bottom in the blue line. And you see disease protective in green and disease associated in red. And effectively, we're seeing a quite high uh, uh, incidence rather uh, above chance in terms of their sitting on the network. But once again, any biological inference is difficult, but we can do statistical inference quite easily. If we build a network of these guys where the red represents seed genes from curated variants and the gray represents these discorrelated genes, these are not now all hubs, but these are just regular discorrelated genes, what we get is a very nice story because we see a high degree of discorrelation in a very short distance away from our um, seed uh, genetic, gen genetically uh, identified variants. And this is a great input signature, even if you reduce it to a list, 
to go in to drug discovery. Okay, why not? See what happens. So to do that, we have to have a network for repositioning. So we have something we call PDN. And that's a correlation matrix expanded on that concept I've just presented to you. How am I doing for time? OK, good. So the bottom line is, I'll go right down to the bottom. This is so interesting to me, right, because of my work. Um, I just want to show you. We effectively find drug, we find correlation. We can identify the pathways that are correlated. We can test them, and we see some really good results. This is the top 10. And what we allow uh, for as well is whether we benchmark well, and actually we do twice as, work, twice as good as any of the other methodologies we've been able to find for looking at this kind of drug repurposing. Um, we can implement this in terms of features, in terms of the uh, uh, machine learning approaches. And uh, uh, once again, Barbara Engerhardt's approach, I think, is very important to think about in this particular uh, area. And you can remember to say thank you to the individuals who have contributed to this, in particular, Kierad at the top and uh, uh, Sarah Morgan and Kat Cole at the bottom. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That was a fascinating talk. Sorry, we had to cut it off. We've got time for just two questions. More questions on that talk? Yes. Okay, so, uh, in terms of your analysis, and you, you, you touched on the reproducibility at, at the beginning, how, how can you factor in some of these questions around the quality of the data that you're using to generate these maps? Um, I think the way to look at that is to find the influence of batch and the influence of, of poor quality on your results. And that requires breaking down the, like thinking about, a, thinking about the perspective like a PCA, how much of the PCA is being determined by what might be batch. Mm -hmm. And that methodology uh, can be taken into uh, latent factor variable analysis. And the take home from that is that you can perform effectively a learning approach or a statistical approach to decompose your data so you can discover how much of it is being uh, messed with by poor quality. And of course, you can just do randomizations as well. Um, we've done a little bit of that, and actually it's been very valuable because it, it's dependent on your input gene sets. But we found that for uh, assaying large-scale gene expression um, across many platforms, if you're able to do that, you can, you can overcome that uh, issue quite easily. Mm -hmm. It's much more problematic when you have smaller data sets. Thank you. Uh, another question? No? If we've got no... Oh, yeah, we've got one question here. It's a really good question. Um, and if I might summarize it in another way, do uh, pathways that are domain specific, you know, specialists that put those together have more value than when you look at data-driven path sets, which clearly associate together with each other in terms of function from a data-driven aspect, in terms of classifying? And the, and the no, your question is exactly the same. I'm just trying to make it sound like I understood you. But the, <laughs> <laughs> my, <laughs> um, um, but the take home is that when you've got a, the latter approach works really well because the data has been trained effectively to build that and then you can use that as a good classifier. A number of the pathways we see are not internally co-expressed or coherently expressed. So it's a really, it's a really important aspect to think. You have to use both. Yeah. Thank okay, you Thank much. you for your time, yeah. sir.